Welcome to Breaking Points Beyond the Headlines. My name is James Lee. Joining us today is Jen Perlman. She is running against Debbie Wasserman Schultz in the Democratic primary to represent Florida's 25th Congressional District. Jen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. Of course, of course. First question has to be, I think, why are you running? Because we all know that the Democratic Party probably doesn't want you to run. So, so tell us, what makes your candidacy different than that of your opponent, Debbie Wasserman Schultz? Okay, so the main reason that I ran in 20 and the same reason that I'm running now is this idea of transforming politics into service. This idea that this is supposed to be a term of service and not a career. And it is certainly not meant to be a lucrative career. So the idea of having somebody in there in representing this district that is not beholden to the military industrial complex, big pharma, APAC, you name it, um, is very appealing to a lot of people in the district. Um, and some people, yes, there's policy and stuff that they're concerned with. But I, I got to tell you, for the most part, what people want is to get rid of the corruption. And as somebody who isn't looking for a second career and doesn't need this job and generally gets like a five-year itch, um, I, this, is not, this is not a career choice for me. It has to be like, I'm not going to sit there. And the only reason I feel like it's hard right now is unseating a corporate incumbent that's backed by APAC, right? This is, this is about unseating a corporate monolith and returning this seat and potentially even the state of Florida to people that may have its best interest at heart over people that do not. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, you brought up APAC several times. So I wanted to ask you recently, they've been openly bragging about their influence in Congress, whether with the, the big bill now to Israel and also yeah. how their support basically guarantees election to Congress. And your opponent takes millions from APAC and there's been a lot written about this as well. How much control do you think pro-Israel lobbies have on members of Congress? Oh, I think they they seem to own them. They seem to own actually all three branches of government and the fourth estate. I find it terrifying. Everybody should be asking themselves, why isn't APAC registered as a foreign agent? Why is APAC the only lobbying group on behalf of a foreign entity that does not have to have its lobbyists registered as foreign agents? Why is that? It's so they can give unlimited dollars. It's that's why. And so, you know, obviously we have, we're being ruled by the Zionist state. You can always tell who's in charge by what you're not allowed to speak out against. So if I can sit here and I can talk about Joe Biden, no problem. I could talk about, you know, I could talk about my congresswoman, no problem. But you talk about Israel, then that's it. So that's clearly who's in charge. Um, I, I basically have told APAC to bring it, bring it. You can call me a self-loathing Jew. You can do whatever you want to do. Like I, I, it's it's of no matter to me. But I will say to people who would like to defeat the concept that electing someone like me as an anti-Zionist Jew over someone like Debbie would be the strongest signal message that the collectively we could send to APAC seriously. That would be like the biggest f you to APAC because right now there aren't any anti-Zionist Jews running for Congress. And I haven't seen any, but maybe a couple even sort of maybe kind of say something that are in there. So, you know, I'm the last thing that they want. Uh, yeah. Speaking of conflation of maybe anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, a lot that's been going on in college campuses, most recently at Columbia with the the Gaza encampment sit-in. Uh, sit and I also saw this morning footage from NYU now, reports of MIT, Tufts, other universities doing the exact same thing. And some in the mainstream are really calling these students terrorists. I've heard that thrown out there. Some members of Congress saying similar, you know, not going as far, but they're saying similar things, basically portraying them as, as not anti-Zionist protests, but also anti-Semitic targeting Jews. Right. Uh, I've seen some videos, you know, both good and bad videos. So I'm wondering, based on your values that you just talked about, what's your reaction to what the students are doing? Um, I could not be prouder. Like I could almost cry. Like I, 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 those kids are the future of everything. Those kids are smart and capable and organized. Like seriously, I could cry. I am so proud of those kids. They're not even my kids, but I'm okay. I'm old enough to be their mother, but I feel like, you know, they are doing, they are kicking ass. I could not stand in more solidarity. And as far as the people that are calling them names and calling them out, 
that is called the death throes of empire and the death throes of capital. And while it looks ugly, it's, it's really a sign. It's a sign. I know that people, you know, it's scary, you know, like what's going on is scary, but I, you know, this is, this is how it needs to be before it can be different. Mm. And so I, I understand that it's very uncomfortable for people, but like those students, that is all my goal in life is to consolidate those people with the union, the labor movement, with the environmentalist movement, with the block cop city movement and everybody. And like, that's the coalition that we need to build. So those, those kids are, you know, they're fighting for everyone. I'm very pleased with them. And they need to, I, I, I am, and I'm also will stand in solidarity with the professors that are putting their careers on the line for standing up for these students. And so, you know, that is something that I, yeah, major respect. If, if you're, I'm curious, if you're one of the university presidents, how would you handle this? Cause it's obviously a very controversial, it's, it's uncomfortable yeah. and they're in a tough spot. So I'm curious how you, how would you handle this? I can actually tell you exactly how I would handle it because I can go back to the first time I saw it was the MIT president and the pen, I think back, like mm -hmm. it was like a few months ago when they were sitting in front and being questioned um, by that vile woman up in New York. And, and they, she was asking them, basically trying to get them to say, okay, that they condone the basically that they condone the suggestion of genocide, okay? By saying that words like intifada and phrases like from the river to the sea are chants for genocide. And right there, when neither of those people spoke up in that moment and looked her in the face and said, nobody's calling for a genocide, that's not what that means. And given that woman the history lesson that she needed at the time, I am so tired of people calling things what they are not. Those chants have nothing to do with anti-Semitism. In fact, they are ethnic cleansing terms that were created by the Likud party in Israel. So if anybody, and I will say this, like I say every time, every single thing that Zionists accuse others of are only admissions of stuff that they do. And you know they're lying when their lips are moving. And I know this because I was trained and brainwashed and grown up all Zionist and proud. And it's taken me about 14 years to deprogram. How did you deprogram yourself? What was your journey there? It's been, you know what? It's taken a long time. And it was, it was definitely like a process. But it started around the time of the second Intifada, um, which was also around the time that I started hearing about BDS. And then I started hearing about anti-BDS legislation. This was it's like early 2000s. Um, and I started looking into that. And then it just sort of unfolded like a house of cards. I'm like, because I am someone who very much believes in the First Amendment. And so the idea that I am not allowed to boycott a foreign entity and also get a contract with a city for, you know, for work, that seems like a violation of my First Amendment to me. And so then I started looking into why are we so scared of BDS? Where does that come from? You know, and it just, it, it was a rabbit hole. And up until even 2019, I still thought that a two-state solution was possible. I was still what you would call, they call them liberal Zionists. Like you, you believe that the state of Israel has a right to exist, but you believe Palestinians should have their own state, those people. Um, and then once you do the research and you realize that there was never an intent by Zionists to have a Palestinian state that was always made up talking point again, like it, the whole thing unraveled. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's my, my background, but it's very upsetting to me. I grew up in a working class family that would send money to Israel to plant trees in Israel. Everything was through JNF. I did a high school program through the Jewish national fund called Alexander Moss high school in Israel where they have us planting trees in occupied territory under under armed guard. And we all thought, oh, that's so cool. This guy has an assault rifle and he's traveling with us. And as a mother, I'm thinking, if you are taking my child somewhere where you think that they need somebody standing over them with an assault rifle to protect them, you are somewhere you ought not be. And therefore you are using my child as a human shield. That's, that's what I think. And also as a tool of ethnic cleansing. 
So my thoughts on APAC are that they can come for me all they want. I know all their secrets. I know all their stories. I know all their talking points and all they have, they have money. They have money. You know, they'll put out tons of constant reminding people over and over again that I support terrorists. I'm a Hamas lover. I'm, you know, they'll put that on repeat. But the problem is at the end of the day, it's still only going to appeal to a very small, finite echo chamber of voters. And the people that will watch that APAC loop over and over, it's not going to expand. That group of people isn't going to just get bigger. You're not going to all of a sudden have somebody that cares about that issue. I, I don't think you're wrong there in terms of the number of people supporting Israel in the same way they have done in the past are, yeah. are going to be smaller and smaller. But we just yeah. saw this past weekend that doesn't really matter in Congress. They just, you know, shove through this $95 billion yep. foreign aid package, Ukraine, Israel, a little bit of time. It wouldn't have had my name on it. I could tell you that right now. It would not have had my name on it. And they could bundle it with all sorts of other stuff. You could bundle it with everything. You could put whipped cream and a cherry on top, and I still would not sign that. So yeah, I, I saw that. And of course, you know, Debbie, she she would she always gives them more money than they ask for. So then, you know, we saw some of the footage coming out this week uh, from the from the weekend, just members of Congress waving foreign flags. And it, it looked, you know, it was a really striking visual to see, especially since we have been more or less gridlocked on a lot of these domestic legislative pieces. But then they got somehow the ability to do that. Also sneaking into a, 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 the, the TikTok ban, which I think is uh -huh. a pretty unpopular legislation um, for, for the American people. Yep. So then what do, what do you say to the folks that, you know, that have kind of just given up on the electoral process and say, well, it doesn't matter who we vote in there. They're just still going to do the things that they do. I, you know what? There is no solid answer for that. I think you got to just be chipping away at it. I mean, look, there were, there were people that didn't sign that. There were, there were people, there were even some Jewish Congress people that didn't sign that. So, you know, they, it, it can be done. You just need to start chipping away at the corporate tentacles that are basically holding people. And you can only do that by electing people that don't take corporate money. And then it becomes even people that don't take corporate money, but they're still scared of being primaried from that corporate money. So even though they're not taking it, they're still sort of acting in accordance with it. So there's a lot of that too. Um, and it's, it, look, I, I don't, I can't speak for anyone else, right? Like I only know how it is for me. And I would just always be as transparent and really bring this home here, what people want, what they want to see, and not just fall in line with a party um, or fall in line with anybody if it's not in the best interest or what the majority of people really want. Yeah. Speak, speaking of political strategy. So I've noticed that if yeah. you compare the more, you can call, you can say more extreme members of each party, the Freedom Caucus, those guys versus yeah. say the squad, one side seems much more willing to play hardball to kind of oh, get yeah. what they want. Now, where, where would you stand? How, how would you approach politics? Um, when I am sitting here and I'm on the same page as people like Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene, and this wasn't the first time, by the way. Now, granted, I will say this. Her reasons for why she would vote no to certain things are completely different than my reasons. OK, like that that's neither here nor there. She doesn't want to give them money because she's worried about China and space lasers or whatever her shit is. But like um, their strategy of really sticking it to their party is that's exactly what we need to be doing. That's exact. That's the whole point of having a progressive caucus, except there's like over a hundred people in the progressive caucus, but yet only how many people signed, didn't sign this resolution. And that's barely being progressive. So no, I, I think that they, they are definitely feckless. I think they don't wield power. I think they're more concerned with getting primaried. I think that um, the rainmakers and the queen bees and whoever in that party just scare them and bully them and, and I don't, again, I don't know because I'm not there, but I, I do know that there are a lot more people listed in the progressive caucus than there are actually seemingly progressive people. So maybe if that caucus actually stood for something and really was a progressive caucus of actual progressive people, um, not people that take like, let's say big farm and insurance money, um, then maybe they'd have power. But they don't have any power because they're infiltrated by so many different people that aren't really with them. Like there's no what what is that? The squad isn't a real thing. That's a made up term by media. That's not a real thing. Yeah. When I'm, when I'm looking at this whole election cycle in, in totality, all the way from the top to the bottom, I kind of see. So there's a lot of people, I think, gravitating towards 
the more Trump-like figures, the the guys who are out there saying, "Hey, we're going to have the best country, the best economy, we yeah. have the jobs coming back, strong border, a little bit of that." You could say, "Just trust me. Give me the keys, and I'm going to take good care of you." Vibes, yes. and then I think the other side, the Democrats, have characterized that kind of mm. posturing as dictatorial, and that's why we need to vote Joe Biden. We got to save democracy. Mm. They don't really talk too much about their domestic agenda beyond anti-Trump. Um, so what I'm curious about is, let's say the Democrats are right. Let's say we go with their definition. One side is is dictatorship. The other side is what maybe what you just kind of characterize as a pseudo-democratic administration that's in effect owned by many of the same groups. Lobbyists, well, I was talking lobbyists. about Congress. If you want to talk about Joe, now we're not just, ta- now we're talking genocidal. So yeah, you might have a dictator on one side, but you got somebody genocidal on the other, but please so, continue. So then what's, so is one side truly that different than the other? I guess, what, what are your no. thoughts on this argument? I think it's absurd. I think the fact that we're sitting here and talking about between those two individuals in particular, that that's the two main choices, that's a sign that we no longer have a democracy. We're already there, people. We have so crossed over into the realm of fascist corporate takeover of this country that I just don't know what to tell you anymore. But the fact that that's the choice, what are you scared? Seriously. And and the thing is, the people that truly do, I have found this, and I have been dialing for dollars a lot lately. So I talk to a lot of people on the phone, and I always say, you know, who do you like in the election? And so I'm talking to a lot of people. And the without without fail, the people whose primary concern is about Trump are more privileged people, without fail. Um, the people who are struggling, working, whatever, they it's they don't even mention Trump. They mention. They mention healthcare, they mention in clean water, they mention wars, they mention those things. So the people that are really so scared of Trump at this point um, are really a small group of people. And it is an establishment, democratic, very elitist group of people. And they are completely out of touch with regular people. Because when you talk to like vulnerable people or in any moment, so for example, Palestinians at the moment, um, I'm pretty sure that there's nothing worse than somebody who's participating in genociding their family. I'm pretty sure that there's no worse than that. Like that's a, that's as bad as you're not going to scare them with anything at this point. So you, you look at the most vulnerable and oppressed people at any time and look at from their perspective, what's their perspective on who would be worse, not who would be worse for rich, you know, you know, elitist America. That doesn't concern me. You look at it for who, what what would be worse for the, the least of these. And I am telling you from someone who has been in the streets with the least of these for the better part of the past five years, it is six of one, half a dozen of the other between those two people. I assure mm-hmm. you. Um, before I let you go, I want to talk about your campaign specifically. So you yeah. ran in 2020 also mm-hmm. against Debbie Wasserman Schultz. You lost, I think the vote count was about 55K for her, 21 for you, 70, 30 yeah. split. So this time yeah. in 2024, what are you trying to do differently? What do you see as your path to victory? You know, between now and August 20th, uh, what are the kinds of things that you and your campaign are doing to strategically try to close that gap? Okay. So let me be very clear, even though I didn't run in 22, um, I have been working canvassing in this district for the past four years whether it was for women's reproductive freedom, whether it was for other candidates, whatever. Okay, so just the amount of community ties, name recognition, build up all of that, um, connections in city commission seats that weren't there four years ago, people that um, are in positions where other people used to put their hands on the weight for Debbie, uh, hands on the scale for Debbie, um, just a lot of things in play there. Um, Also, just having my podcast, having more name recognition, but our district lines, have also changed. And the entire um, Dade County portion that used to be in our district, which is coastal, affluent, very Jewish, um, that entire portion is no longer in our district. And instead we gained an area, a town called Miramar, which is very working class, canvassable, regular people, heavy Latino, um, a lot of uh, Haitian Islander, you know, working people, but most importantly, canvassable because the rich hoity-toity high rises that got cut out of our district were areas that we couldn't even canvass as a grassroots campaign. So the only way in those is TV and mailers, which we could do a couple, 
but she's able to like flood it. So to get rid of portions of the district that aren't canvassable is a huge gain for us. But then you also look at the demographic that she lost. She lost she lost a lot of wealthy Jewish people. It's actually where I'm from is the part of the district that's no longer in district where I grew up is that. Um, and so what we gained is not that. So the demographic has changed uh, as well. That is also in favor of people fighting for working class issues. So there's been a lot of different variables. Um, and honestly, what's going on in, in Gaza is that that makes it almost a perfect storm in terms of the people that have been reaching out to me and wanting to support me and people, especially in the Muslim community that aren't overly politically involved normally, but are very organized and involved right now. And I just feel like the tide is turning. It just feel it just feels it just feels different this time. And again, it's still it's still an uphill battle to unseat an incumbent. You know what I mean? It's by no means it's by no means just like a gimme, no matter what. Um, but I definitely know that we have made huge advancements in terms of my um, presence in the community as well as national for fundraising and name recognition. I actually have a team this time, which is amazing because last time it was my business partner and I, and it was just the two of us basically. And we had some people helping us do stuff, but we were, we, it's, this is so much better to have. It's so nice to have a campaign manager. It's so nice to have a finance person. It's just, it's like, it's, it feels almost luxurious to me. So I feel like the way that I did it the first time being so insane made it that maybe this is why it's easy or feels easier to me. Maybe that's why like people, maybe if you start this way, you're just used to having a campaign manager and, and a comms person and all that. Like, I don't, we're not used to that. So I definitely feel like there's a team of people working really, really hard. And I'm, it's, yeah, it's Absolutely. inspiring. So where, where can people find more information about your campaign if they're interested in learning more, perhaps even getting involved? Oh, for sure. At Jen, J-E-N, 2024.org and go there, sign up. Um, all of the links are social media are on there. I do not want to begin to tell you what all the social media handles are. I just, I, I can't. So go to gen2024.org. Um, and if you're local by any chance and you would like to help locally, we'd love to have you sign up and show up in an event or something like that too. Um, but anybody can volunteer from anywhere. And if you want to even host a fundraiser, we can do those on Zoom. If you have like a group of people that you think would be interested in having a chat, you know, like I could be, you know, I do gen, I could do gen talks for hire. Um, they're, we just, they're Zoom fundraisers. Uh, and we have a few different things coming up that are, that are going to be fun. Uh, we're going to be having a Jesse Ventura fundraiser um, that he's going to do for us. And that's the one coming up that is a public, it will be a public thing soon. All right. Well, Jen Perlman, everybody, we appreciate you for joining us today on Breaking Points. Best of luck on Absolutely. the campaign trail. Thank you.